There's been a lot of talk recently about this idea of systemic racism, sometimes called institutional racism, and basically the idea is that the systems and institutions in this country are inherently racist, and it is for that reason that we see differences between white people and black people in things like incarceration rates, wealth, loan approval rates, etc. But what you'll find is that the levels to which these activists are willing to go in speculating and extrapolating to preserve this narrative approach the levels of, like, flat eartherism. Uh, for example, you've got people like Tariq Nasheed who claim that the reason that Asian people are on average more successful than white people in this country is because white people use their system of white supremacy to artificially elevate Asian people so as not to reveal themselves as the ones really in control of things. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm not in that group chat. But anyways, these ideas have been pretty well debunked by people on the right. But I've got some things that I think are important to add. And so we'll go through some of the logical inconsistencies within the idea and the surrounding movement, uh, and we'll also disprove the specific examples of systemic racism in employment, uh, our justice system, wealth, all sorts of stuff. It's going to be another long one, another big fella, definitely going to want to watch all the way through, watch it in parts if you have to, should be very epic, so do stay tuned. John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off Kami. This is your second reminder that the long-awaited, much-requested Heck Off Kami Discord server is up and running. If you want access, you have to get a membership over at heckoffkami.com for $4. It's been a blast so far, so the people complaining about having to pay $4 for a Discord, it's just not fair. The reason we do it isn't even for money. It's to maintain a high average IQ in the server. We know that IQ is one of the strongest predictors of income, so if you're complaining about $4 to support the channel, probably means that you didn't belong in the server in the first place, quite frankly. But anyways, speaking very broadly, Oddly. Systemic racism is a pretty new vocab word for us. It's not something that's been in the mainstream for a while. Uh, and that's because the 2010s were the decade in which everything became woke. We're probably going to have to spend the rest of our lives uh, trying to undo the damage that occurred in that decade and, of course, in the previous decades. But a great way that we know this is by running searches in LexisNexis, which is a huge, huge research database. And we can find graphs of the prevalence of certain terms in the New York Times, which we'll use as sort of this uh, focal point of American journalism and news. And what we see is the prevalence of things like whiteness, critical race theory, which I like to pretend is the theory that white people are the only race that you can be critical of. But I think it actually means basically like viewing all issues through a racially based lens. Um, also, unconscious bias, white privilege, systemic racism, discrimination, social justice, racism, white supremacy, implicit bias etc. The prevalence of all these in mainstream news and journalism has skyrocketed. And so we have to ask ourselves why that is, because looking at our country objectively, it's inarguably become less racist since like the 1960s culturally, 100% legally. There are no laws that are written to discriminate against minorities. In fact, we now have laws that grant minorities legal privileges, which technically means they discriminate against white people. But anyways, despite all of this, there are still disparities between races of people in America. And so the idea is that this is because of racism. Now, as far as how to actually go about fighting this systemic racism, it's pretty hard to find a clear guide. Uh, even if you read articles about all the different ways that you can fight systemic racism, you'll basically find that they boil down to contact apology. Politician. They don't really tell you what to say other than we want justice and stop racism. By the way, if you actually want to stop racism, I'll show you how I did it at the end of the video. But uh, they'll also tell you to give money to groups of people who are supposedly working towards these goals or they'll tell you to prioritize giving money to businesses operated by black people or sign petitions calling for justice and just more vague pontification. So what it really boils down to once you figure out what they actually want, uh, once you get past the yard signs and the chanting, when you get to like what they're actually calling for, what they're saying is that the only way to combat systemic racism is to write into the system advantages for people of color, but specifically black people, which would imply that what is keeping black people down isn't the system. System, but the choices that they make. And the reason for that is when you have systems like we do in America that not only don't discriminate, but even go as far as to actively protect against discrimination, if you're going to get different results in that system, which treats everyone equally on paper, then it must be the fault of the individuals and not the system. And to this, they'll say, well, but it doesn't treat people the same. That's the problem. And they'll show you figures that show differences between groups of people and claim that that's because of racism. What that fails to take into account is like we said, the system is applied equally to everyone. So if you're seeing things like higher rates of incarceration between groups, for example, that would be exactly what we would expect if we had an objective legal system and we had differences in crime rates between groups of people, which is exactly the case if you look at the data. And so the point is that by these advocacy groups saying that the only way to fix the system is by writing into it advantages for minority groups, they're implicitly acknowledging that the system isn't the reason for the differences in outcome, but rather it's the result of choices being made by the individuals, which we'll get into in more detail as we continue. But that's why it's difficult to establish 
a clear definition or example of racism and discrimination in America because racism doesn't actually exist anymore in the way that they claim that it does. It's not a real thing. And that's the strategy behind it. It is vaguely defined and it is applied selectively and ambiguously so as to keep those in power and control of you and the narrative. That's why we scratch our heads when they're openly racist against white people or they're in support of things like Planned Parenthood, which has been responsible for the murder of millions of black children. And we're scratching our heads because we make the mistake of believing that they actually care about racism, but they don't. They never did. What they care about is power. That's why fighting racism is literally a billion dollar industry now, why a movement which supposedly seeks to spread the idea that Black Lives Matter is actually a spearhead for a radically left agenda, the likes of which we've never seen before as far as their power and influence go. And that's why the entire media and establishment of mega corporations, and of course, all of the left, but even a bunch of supposedly Republican politicians, they're all right there behind them because they want power. And the beauty of it is that they maintain this narrative of revolution and being the counterculture, despite the fact that they're literally in control of everything just mentioned, all because they're stupid. They think that their grandma making a negative comment about their nose piercing is evidence that they're the dissenting voice in society, but they're not. The system and the society that they're supposedly fighting against is literally just me, you, Donald Trump, and the MyPillow guy. Like, that's our A-team. You know, of course there are other people, but you get the point. We're not exactly in the best position right now, but those are the questions that they have no answers for. And we'll get into those in greater detail, but questions like, since America has undeniably become less racist in the last 60 years, why have things largely not changed as far as disparities between black people and white people go? And why have they gotten worse in many cases, such as wealth gaps between black people and white people, uh, differences in the rates of single motherhood, income gaps between black men and white men, uh, income gaps between black women and white women, the fact that the poverty rate was declining until the 1960s, the same decade in which the majority of the civil rights movement took place, but then once the war on poverty occurred, occurred, the poverty rate started to increase dramatically. How is it that America has become less racist, but the things that our racism is supposedly causing have become much worse? And how is it that gaps between white people and Hispanics exist? When have we ever systemically oppressed Hispanic people? And if you can find proof of that, can you explain why we oppress them less than blacks? Since that's what the disparities would suggest if we operate under the assumption that they're caused by racism. And also, why do we love Asians more than ourselves? Why do we allow Asians to do better than us by so many significant metrics? Also interesting about this theory of systemic racism is that they admit that even if there were no racist people occupying the system, it would still be racist by virtue of its existence, and it's impossible to change that. Therefore, it has to be replaced with something something woke and progressive as decided by everyone except white men who like to pray to God, save their country, and kiss girls in that order. And the problem is that if the system exists on paper with no reference to targeting specific groups of people, complete equality under the law, then if there are differences in outcomes between groups of people under that system, even if according to them, those in charge of maintaining and operating that system were not at all racist or subject to bias, then that must be because those groups on average do not exhibit exactly the same behavior. That is how a rational person would interpret what we're dealing with here. And on top of that, we now have a system that actively benefits non-white people with things like affirmative action, subsidized loan programs, diversity quotas, etc., etc. So now, even when that system is actively giving different groups an advantage over other groups, those differences exist. And if that doesn't compel you to think that perhaps it isn't actually the system and it's just people being free to make choices and then choosing different things, then you should probably just stop watching now because none of what we're about to get into is going to, to change your mind because at that point, you're not concerned with truth. You're concerned with social adulation, with virtue signaling. It is basically unlikely that you view the world as anything that deviates from all 7 billion of us being only two hours of diversity training away from singing Kumbaya and doing trust falls. It's just not a realistic view of the world. And if you actually want to solve the problems, you have to identify them correctly. But you don't actually want to solve the problems. You just want to use them as a Trojan horse to fundamentally decompose and irreparably alter the country, which is why you say things like, it seems like there are too many black men in prison. Hey, do you want to destroy the Western nuclear family and get people to stop thinking that being straight is normal? It's dishonest. It's destructive. But most of all, the greatest sin of them all, it's just plain annoying. It could have been so beautiful. I just wanted to grill. That's all I wanted. But now we can't. You guys ruined it. That's the difference between us and everyone who doesn't get it. We know that we can never go back to the barbecue. But we'll get into it now. We're going to go through the six most common examples of systemic racism or institutional racism. Uh, and a lot of times there are connections between them. And so we'll do our best to sort of explain those connections and how racism isn't the reason for these disparities on a categorical level, um, but also on an interconnected level. And so, and also that just makes sense logically. Like assuming that we can rule out racism as the cause of disparities in levels of education between groups of people, then that would mean that if we're looking at like income disparities between people, uh, we can't say, well, oh, it's because of racism in the education system, which makes people earn less money. Because, you know, we've already ruled that out. That would be circular reasoning, which is fallacious, but uh, 
We're going to go through wealth, education, loans, employment, income, and crime. And another thing to note before we get started is that one of the cores of liberal thought, stemming back to John Locke's blank slate, is this idea that we're all fundamentally the same, not just that we deserve to be treated with dignity and respect uh, because we're human beings, but we're literally like all the same. And the only thing that makes us different is the environments in which we were raised. And I talked about this more thoroughly in uh, How We Let America Die, which is a video that you should definitely go watch after this if you haven't already. But um, this is what leads us to this idea that we can basically ensure equality of outcome by just like throwing money at people or by giving them special advantages or legal privileges. Uh, but what we find is that it isn't actually that simple and it often just exacerbates the problem. But Anyways, let's talk about wealth now. So the idea is basically that the reason that there's such a large gap in the wealth between an average black family and an average white family is because of things like slavery crippling black people, racist lenders refusing black people loans for homes, uh, earning less money because of racism in the workplace, and fewer educational opportunities because of racism. All this has led to white families having a lot more money and then passing that down throughout uh, generations and black families not being able to do that because of racism. So this assumes a few things. We'll go through them one at a time. Uh, the first thing I want to start with is slavery. There's this vague narrative that is simply that because of slavery hundreds of years ago, black Americans are disadvantaged in society. Besides the obvious evilness of slavery, they were also stunted in terms of literacy, occupational, economic mobility, and education. Now, since we can point to examples of systemic racism against black Americans even after slavery was abolished, the best way that we could test the residual effects of slavery on black Americans would be by comparing the descendants of freed black people to the descendants of black people who were born enslaved. Because if we just compared either group to the average American or to anyone else, it's not going to take anti-black discrimination into account. And so, Research has been conducted on this, and what we find is exactly what we would expect, that there is a gap between the successes of the children of slaves um, who became free versus the children of black people who were born free. And so that being said, the research also shows that the gaps between those people in terms of basic outcomes such as literacy, schooling, and occupational and economic mobility effectively disappeared within two generations. So within two generations, the descendants of slaves were not doing worse than the descendants of free blacks. Now, of course, they were still going to be doing worse than the average white person, but the point is that we can rule out slavery as the reason for that since we were able to isolate it and find that whatever those effects may have been had disappeared within two generations. So if the effects were gone by the grandchildren of slaves, it is extraordinarily unlikely that they would be affecting current or future generations of black Americans. Now, that might seem counterintuitive, but it's actually pretty consistent with the way that things transfer between generations. In this particular case, wealth, um, not only in 19th century America, but in contemporary America as well. For example, we have research from broadly the same period of time that explores whether the descendants of those who won the Georgia land lotteries in the early 19th century um, did better in terms of income, wealth, and literacy rates. Um, and for those unfamiliar, Back in the early 1800s, uh, there was a period of about 30 years where if you were a qualified citizen, you could register to win lots of land that formerly belonged to Creek and Cherokee Indians that were being lotteried for very low sales prices. And so what this research found is that there was no difference between the descendants of those who won versus those who did not in terms of wealth, literacy, or, um, or income. And so we also have data that looks at those whose wealth was destroyed during the Civil War due to slave emancipation and property destruction related to the war. And it shows that a person's wealth being destroyed by 10% predicted a 0.4% decrease in the income of their children. Children, and by the next generation, it probably wouldn't be much more than 0%. And it certainly wouldn't be greater than 0% 100 years later when those generations are being born. And so the point of this is that wealth doesn't just transfer in a constant state between generations. There's something of a half-life to it. Uh, you know, it depends on the actions of the people at the time. This is why welfare has been a complete failure, why public education spending has been a complete failure, because you can't just throw money at things and expect them to work. That assumes that the only problem is that they didn't have the money or the resources. Everything else was just the same. And that's not actually true. For whatever reason, money doesn't transfer between generations of black Americans as much as it does white Americans. And the obvious objection to this would be, well, black people can't save as much money for their children because they aren't making enough to even pay their bills because of racism. But that just isn't true. So just bear with me for a second. There's research that examines the levels of wealth between generations of different groups of people. And what it finds is that if you take the wealth of a white person's grandparents and and you double it, then that will predict an 18% increase in the level of that person's wealth. But if you do the same thing with a black person's grandparents, then it will only predict a 2% increase in the level of that person's wealth. And a 2% increase is not statistically significant, so it's possible that it's just a sampling error and that the relationship with the general population is actually just that it has no effect. So in addition to that, we also have data that shows that black children who are born to parents in the top 20% of the income distribution are equally likely to end up in either the top 20% or the bottom 20% of the income distribution, whereas white children who are born to parents in the top 20% of the income distribution are much more likely to remain there than they are to end up in the bottom 20%.
And so what this demonstrates is that wealth disappears so much within one generation of black Americans that the ideas that it can be stemmed back to slavery or even pre-civil rights era America are extremely unlikely and not very likely, respectively. And if that's not the case, then why is it that black Americans born to wealthy parents are equally likely to fall into the bottom 20% as they are to remain in the top 20%? The left will say because of racism and other parts of their lives, and we'll get into those, but just keep in mind that they're going to want to hop from wealth to education to income to crime to everything because they don't want you to be able to corner them because their ideas won't survive that way. But the point is that this is not an indictment of black people. And this goes for the whole video. This is not me saying black people are in this position and it's their fault because X, Y, Z. No, I don't feel as though it's my place to criticize black America. But what I will do is exonerate white people from blame. I will tell you that these problems exist, but that they're not the fault of white people or the systems built by white people. And I will prove that to you. And I will highlight different decisions that are made by groups of people on average that are ultimately their responsibility and their prerogative. They are free to do these things, but but again, this is not an indictment, but we can't pretend that decisions don't have consequences. And like I said, people are going to want to jump around with wealth in particular because there are so many different things that can contribute to it. So the slavery thing aside, what it really comes down to is saving and spending patterns when controlled for factors such as income. And what we find is that black people have lower savings rates than white people do on average, even when controlling for income. And if money isn't being transferred between generations, the implication of that is that it isn't being saved and it's instead being spent. And that's exactly what the research shows. And I'm going to read to you from an article uh, written by a very bright young man named Coleman Hughes, with whom some of you may be familiar um, because he's written about this before. And I'll try to put something interesting up on screen uh, to accompany this. But he wrote, quote, No element of culture harms black wealth accrual more directly than spending patterns. Nielsen, one of the world's leading market research firms, keeps extensive data on American consumer behavior broken down demographically. A 2017 Nielsen report found that compared to white women, black women were 14% more likely to own a luxury vehicle, 16% more likely to purchase costume jewelry, and 9% more likely to purchase fine jewelry. A similar Nielsen report from 2013 found that while only 62% of all Americans owned a smartphone, 71% of blacks owned one. Moreover, all of these spending differences were unconditional on wealth and income. To what extent do poor spending habits explain the persistence of the wealth gap? Economists at the University of Chicago and the University of Pennsylvania asked this question after analyzing 16 years of nationally representative data from the Consumer Expenditure Survey. Consistent with the Nielsen data, they found that blacks with comparable incomes to whites spent 17% less on education and 32% more on visible goods, defined as cars, jewelry, and clothes. What's more, after controlling for visible spending, they concluded that the wealth gap between blacks and whites conditional on permanent income declines by 50%. To be clear, that 50% figure doesn't pertain to the total wealth gap, but to the proportion of the gap that remains after income is taken into account, which was 40%. The upshot? The fact that blacks spent more on cars, jewelry, and clothing explained fully 20% of the total racial wealth gap. To make matters worse, spending patterns are just one part of a larger set of financial skills on which blacks lag behind. Researchers at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis followed over 40,000 families from 1989 to 2013, tracking their wealth accumulation and financial decisions. They developed a financial health scale ranging from 0 to 5 that measured the degree to which families made, quote, routine financial health choices that contribute to wealth accumulation, like saving any amount of money, paying credit card bills, on time, having a low debt to income ratio, etc. At 3.12, Asian families scored the highest, followed by whites at 3.11, Hispanics at 2.71, and blacks at 2.63. Next, they asked if education accounted for the differences in financial habits by limiting the comparison to middle-aged families with advanced degrees. Surprisingly, they found that the racial gap in financial health scores didn't shrink, it widened. Highly educated Asian families scored 3.49, comparable whites scored 3.38, comparable Hispanics scored 2.94, and comparable blacks remained far behind at 2.66. So that's all very interesting. And notice how Asians have better financial health scores than white people do. They also have a greater household income, a greater level of education, etc., etc. And these are things that the left doesn't want to talk about because their narrative can't explain them. Other things that their narrative can't explain is why since the 1960s in America, the black family structure has gotten worse. The income gap between white women and black women has gotten bigger, along with the income gap between black men and white men, along with the gap in wealth between white families and black families, the unemployment gap between white people and black people, and also that the poverty rate was decreasing until the 1960s when the war on poverty occurred, and then the poverty rate started to increase. Like, how did all of this happen as we were making progress? How did all of that happen while the New York Times was educating or indoctrinating us to do better? How did all of that happen while our country completely abolished racism within institutions and even granted privileges to non-white people, even while we had a black president? What about 
about the difference in the rates of homeownership between decades being basically insignificant? What about that? The point is that if the effects of slavery and discrimination were the cause of these things, you'd expect them to diminish over time, but they haven't been, and in some cases, they've even been getting worse. Now, this doesn't explain all of it. Remember, these are all very intertwined, but it does explain some of it. Breakdown of the family structure is also very significant to this. That's an entirely separate video, but you'd be surprised at how much these gaps between white people and black people would disappear uh, when you control for family structure. But anyways, um, now we'll get on to education. So the idea here is that black people don't have access to the same educational opportunities as white people, and this is partially why these disparities exist, such as income and eventually wealth, or so it is thought. How do we fix this according to the left? You guessed it. You throw money at it. You give black students special privileges. Has any of it worked? Evidently not. But this is probably the most complex between the six, and so we'll try to go through it piece by piece. But we we do have to, of course, point out that there are gaps in education between groups of people. We know that Asian people complete more schooling on average than do white people, and white people more than do Hispanic and black people. And we see the same pattern when we look at the average grade point averages um, of these groups. And so the left looks at this, and they reasonably infer that it must be because minority students, particularly black students, must attend lower quality schools, which is why their performance is worse. How do they expect to improve the quality of the schools? Diversity initiatives aside, uh, money is thought to play a large role. So the left often claims that black schools receive less funding than white schools. But before we look at this directly, we have to figure out if funding is even related to the quality of a school in the way that they think it is, as far as per pupil spending. There was a study done that analyzed the impact of test scores of 68 to changes in state level school spending between 1990 and 2013, and it estimated that a $500 increase in spending led to a 0 0.09 standard deviation increase in test scores. And in statistics, the standard deviation is just how far the points are from the average of the data set, generally speaking. But we've also got data that looked at how variation in school funding because of the Great Recession impacted the performance of students, and it found that a 10% reduction in spending led to a 0.078 standard deviation decrease in test scores and a 2.6% decrease in the graduation rates. And then we've got data that analyzes the changes in school funding based off changing property values in 24 states. And it estimates that a 10% increase in spending leads to between a 0.05 and 0.09 standard deviation increase in test scores and between a 2.1 and a 4.4% increase in the graduation rates. Then finally, data from 2015 that analyzes changes to school spending and estimated the relationships, which concluded that a 10% increase in per pupil spending each year for all 12 years of public school leads to 0.27 more completed years of education, 7.25% higher wages, and a 3.67 percentage point reduction in the annual incidence of adult poverty, and also that the effects are much more pronounced for children from low-income families. So we've got several analyses which utilize different data sets to suggest that school spending does have a moderate effect on test scores and future life outcomes. Now from there, the left will say that black students have fewer resources allocated to their schools and that white schools are better funded. But what they're ignoring is that if you look at where the money actually goes within school school districts, it is disproportionately given to black schools. There was a study done in 2017 that concluded that poor and minority students on average receive 1-2% to 2 more resources than non-poor and white students in the same district. So because whiter school districts get more funding, but whiter schools get less funding within school districts, we have to look at school level spending in order to get good numbers for per pupil spending. For that, there was a study done in 2008 which calculated the spending per pupil in U.S. schools between 1972 and 2002, and it found that in 1972 the ratio of non-white to white spending was 0.9 and that this trend had reversed by 1982 because the spending per pupil for non-white students was slightly higher than for white students in most states and in the United States as a whole, and it's been this way for the past 20 years. And so since 1982, spending per pupil on non-white students has been greater on average than spending per pupil for white students. There was another study done on this in 2011 that affirmed this. They found that spending on black students was 1% greater than spending on white students, while spending on Asian and Hispanic students uh, was a few percentage points lower. Now, what the left likes to do is point to states where black students might be receiving 10% less funding than white students, uh, but then they'll ignore or even celebrate other states in which black students are receiving like 18% more funding than white students. But the point is that if we're looking at the whole system on average, and we're trying to explain why these outcomes are so different on average, when we're talking about national populations, then obviously the correct figure to reference would be the national average, which shows that spending doesn't actually systemically favor white students. If anything, it's actually leaning towards favoring black students. So another thing that's important for quality education is, of course, the size of the class or the ratio of teachers to students. Seems like it would be pretty common sense, but there's also data that we can reference to sort of guide how we're thinking about this. So um, there's a meta-analysis that was done a few decades ago, but I still think that it's relevant because it included over 75 papers, and I don't know that the relationship between teachers and pupils has really changed that drastically since then. Plus, it affirms what common sense would suggest along with what more recent papers suggest. But anyways, the point is that it found that students in smaller classes score significantly higher than students in larger classes, but once you get past about 20 kids, the effect is 
like basically inconsequential. So in other words, going from eight kids to 20 kids has a much more significant effect than going from like 20 to 35 kids, if that makes sense. Like it reaches a point where the additional divide in individually allocated attention doesn't even make a difference on the student. Um, and then there was a study done in 2005 that drew data from over a thousand effect sizes and it produced an effect of 0.13, which is somewhat significant, but not exactly groundbreaking, even though this didn't have as many controls as it should have. But then there was another meta-analysis from 1989 with much better controls that produced the same effect size. So there's likely some merit um, to it as far as the empirical evidence that smaller classes increase student performance. And in addition to that, many states have launched programs to reduce class sizes and they seem to have had some success. Analysis of these programs in Tennessee, for example, showed that being placed into a class or classes with fewer than 17 students predicted a 0.22 standard deviation increase in performance. And a follow-up of this program uh, showed that the effects were still present five years later. And then something similar was done in Wisconsin with reducing class sizes to 15 students per teacher and was found to increase performance by about 0.2 standard deviations within five years. So from this, we can infer that the size of the class does have some effect on the performance of the student. And from there, we can also observe that the racial differences in class sizes in schools were effectively non-existent by the early 1970s. And even in the South by the late 1940s, I think, during segregation, the differences in class sizes were probably too small for that to have seriously mattered. And that doesn't mean that there weren't a host of other problems at that time. It just means that we can probably exclude the sizes of the classes from consideration. But class size being a significant variable is sort of contingent upon teachers being competent. Because if your teacher sucks, it doesn't really matter, you know, how many kids are in the classroom. They're probably not going to be learning a whole lot. So the question then is, how do we classify a good teacher? Well, when we look at regression models with tons of controls for different metrics by which the competence of one as a teacher might be evaluated, we find that these different metrics don't seem to predict the future income of the students much at all. But these aren't that great because they usually control for educational attainment. And if your school sucks, your likelihood of going to college is going to be less, which could impact your future income. So looking at individual teachers isn't enough. Um, but in studies that look at the relationship between school quality, earnings, and college choice in the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth and concerning the proportion of teachers at a high school with graduate degrees, they found that a 5.75 point increase in the proportion of highly educated teachers predicted a 1% increase in college attendance and a quarter percent increase in an individual's wages. And that's not exactly significant. But even if we assume that these characteristics of teachers do impact future success, that still doesn't explain the left's narrative because on average, blacker schools have more experienced teachers with more formal education and higher salaries. And even in the segregated South, the pay of black and white teachers equalized in the 1950s. So given all that, the quality of teachers, at least in the way that we think, uh, is unlikely to explain the differences that we're talking about. So from there, we can get into the types of classes that are being offered at the schools. Uh, that's, of course, going to impact the overall quality of the schools. And the narrative goes that one of the reasons that we see these differences is that black schools offer fewer classes than white schools. 71% of white Americans, 70% of Asian Americans, and 67% of Hispanic Americans attend high schools that offer Algebra 1 and 2, Geometry, Calculus, Biology, Chemistry, and Physics. But these courses are only available for 57% of African Americans. Now, it's possible that taking these classes has an effect on future income. Sometimes you'll see studies that show that taking these types of advanced classes in high school can impact your future earnings by as much as like 7%. But the problem is that these studies don't take into account traits that might enable someone to do well in these types of classes, um, such as self-discipline and intelligence, which are both things that also lead to a higher income. So this creates a false correlation. Like, I'm not a disciplined genius because I took a dozen AP classes, but instead I took them because of that, because big brain. It is not the big that decides the brain, but rather the brain that decides the big. That is the most insightful thing I've ever said. But that aside, looking at AP classes, there's no obvious relationship between how black a school is and how likely they are to offer AP level classes. And since the 1990s, the schools that have been the least likely to offer AP classes have all been the whitest schools. And there's a few state level analyses that support this. Like in Florida, uh, black and Hispanic students are about as likely as white students to attend schools that offer AP classes. Um, and the same seems to be the case in like Texas and California with only a slight difference, etc. So in general, there doesn't seem to be any merit to this idea that black students don't have access to AP classes. And also, black students make up about 9% of the students who take AP exams every year, but they only make up about 4% of the students who pass an AP exam. And among black students who take an exam, only 26% uh, receive a qualifying score. For those unfamiliar, you have to score at least a three to pass an AP exam and they're scored out of five. So for white students, the average score is 2.97, which suggests broadly speaking that white students are taking the right amount of AP classes because if you restricted that to like a smaller number of students who scored higher, like a four or higher, then you'd be excluding students who were qualified and who would have passed the exam with like a three. But for black students, the average score is a 1.91, which suggests that more black students are attempting AP exams than are qualified to pass them. So not only is it that there's no real difference between class offerings, but also that more black students are taking 
taking AP exams than should be just based on scores. And a lot of that has to do with the differences in the amount of time spent studying or doing homework, which we're about to get into. But the point is that given this information and given that class offerings haven't been shown to causally impact success and the fact that differences in offerings aren't that significant, the idea that differences in general education levels or future income can be explained by this really doesn't have much merit to it uh, and certainly not if it's being blamed on racism. But another very important factor in the quality of education and arguably one of the most important factors is how the students behave in school. Are they focused on learning? Are they disruptive, etc.? And by the way, anecdotal, but teachers working in these inner city schools have reached out to me to tell me that this all stems from the home. Parents don't discipline their kids and then the parents want to blame the schools and they want to blame the teachers, which in our case would be the system. It's just, it's ridiculous. But anyways, uh, for some reason, it is the case that black and Hispanic students spend less time on homework than white students and white students spend less time than Asian students. This is true despite the fact that black and Hispanic students are more likely than white and Asian students to have parents who check to see that their homework is completed. And please, please spare me the, well, it's because they have to spend time working to support their families. No, it isn't. As of 2018, among youth enrolled in high school, white students were the most likely to be employed at 22%, followed by black and Hispanic students at 14%, um, and Asian students at 11% because of that Asian privilege of theirs. And in addition to that, Black and Hispanic students tend to misbehave more while in school as early as preschool, as the LA Times reports. The Civil Rights Data Collection, a national survey conducted by the U.S. Department of Education, gathered information on more than 50 million students at more than 95,000 schools. The survey included about a million and a half preschool students in about 30,000 schools. They found that black preschool children overall were 3.6 times as likely to be suspended as white preschoolers. And then research from there shows that these gaps in suspension rates persist as kids grow older and remain even after controlling for socioeconomic status. But that aside, and this is interesting, those gaps disappear when comparing people with the same previous histories of behavioral problems or when comparing people who were both sent to the principal's office for the same reason. And that suggests that racial differences in suspension and expulsion rates are due to differences in behavior rather than bias in rule enforcement by racist faculty. Also important to note, there are differences between groups of students in bullying behavior. We find that black students are more likely to be bullies than are white students, while white students are more likely uh, than black students to be the victims of bullying, and Hispanic students are more likely than black students to be engaged in bullying, but also more likely than black students to be a victim of bullying. And also that racial differences um, in family, socioeconomic status, neighborhood socioeconomic status, attachment to friends, parents, school, and physical development don't explain these differences in bullying. Also important to note is that black on white bullying is 64% more common than is white on black bullying, which isn't exactly what you would expect in a racist white supremacist school system. And part of what causes these differences is that bullying is socially rewarded in these student subcultures. We find that after controlling for gender, age, academic performance, family structure, parental educational attainment, and extracurricular activities, the more non-white students bully others, the more popular they are among their peers. And for whatever reason, this effect does not exist among white students. This is a very sad and unfortunate reality. And don't you dare for a second pretend that it's not true because black kids get bullied by other black kids for acting white if they resist these types of subcultures. And if you don't believe me, it's probably because you're one of these white liberals whose high school was like 98% white. But considering things like in-class behavior, study habits, etc., seem to be much more realistic than just screaming racism, you know? And this is why school choice would be great, because there's no reason that a black student should have to stay in an environment where he's bullied for acting white by intently focusing on his classes. So after all that, we've seen that there's actually a pro-black bias in terms of overall spending, class size, teacher quality. There might be a pro-white bias in terms of the classes that are offered, but again, there's no evidence that really shows that this is true. Uh, and even if it is, it can't really account for more than a tiny proportion of income differences, assuming that they even have an effect at all, which again, as we've already talked talked about is questionable. So on the net, it actually seems that there's something of a pro-black bias in American high schools. Um, and the same is true in our university system. And this is easier to show. Uh, once qualifications are controlled for, black applicants are roughly 20 times more likely than white applicants to be admitted to a university, law school, or medical school. And Hispanic Americans are three times as likely to be accepted. And specifically in selective colleges, it's been estimated that the proportion of students who are white would increase from 66 to 75% if admissions were based solely on test scores. Plus, once actually in college, minority students are more likely to receive aid in paying for their education. They account for 38% of the student population and 40.4% of grant funding, while white students account for 61.8% of all students and 59.3% of grant funding. So it's not a huge difference, but it's still a difference. And if it were reversed, we'd definitely be talking about it. So there's that. But there's also a slight trend of white students being more likely than black students to be employed while in college and Asian students being the least likely to be employed, Asian privilege, uh, which leads into the fact that black, Hispanic, and white students have similar chances of their parents paying for a significant proportion of their college education, whereas Asian students 
students are more likely than others to have that parental aid because Asian privilege. So it turns out that there's actually a strong anti-white bias in college admissions and just a slight anti-white bias in college funding, which is contrary to the narrative of systemic racism in education against black students in favor of white students. But the most interesting thing in my opinion is that when you control for all factors so that the only difference between people is the color of their skin, black Americans actually have higher educational attainment than do white Americans. And you might remember that in the beginning we talked about the differences um, in the averages between groups, but if you control for the relevant factors according to the data from the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, black students actually achieve more education than white students, which is exactly what we'd expect if our education system had a pro-black bias, which as we've just discussed, it clearly does. So that's education, but from there we can get into loans. Um, the argument here is that racial differences in the ability to acquire a loan are evidence of anti-black racism or white privilege, um, and they're said to lead to disparities in the rates of home ownership, which then have their own range of long-term socioeconomic consequences. So looking at data from Pew Research, we can see that it's true that black people are indeed more likely to be denied for a mortgage loan, but even amongst blacks, the rate of denial is like 27%. And assuming that's because of racism, like practically speaking, it isn't that racist. Like it could be worse. Let's be glasses half full, right? That's a joke. But you get the point. Like if racism in the loan system were really contributing to so much of the hardship that black Americans face, you'd expect it to be more than 27% racist. But that being said, it's also true that black people are more than twice as likely as white people to get a mortgage interest rate um, of 8% or more. But this is actually very rare even amongst black holders. Like if you look at the average interest rates between white, Hispanic, and black people, they're actually pretty similar. But Asians tend to be a bit lower uh, because of that Asian privilege, of course. But even then, we can't necessarily infer from that a racial bias against black people because as we talked about, black people and white people don't have the same behaviors with money. There was another study done on this that examined data on over 25,000 American households, and it found that the homes of black Americans had lower rates of saving money than the homes of white Americans, even after controlling for differences in income, age, family size, education, and marital status, all the relevant variables at which banks and lenders would be looking. And this could be why black people and white people with equal incomes don't have the same credit scores. Even 20 years ago, the Washington Post would publish articles citing studies that found that white Americans earning less than $25,000 a year had better credit records as a group than black Americans earning between sixty-five dollars and $75,000 a year, and that overall, 48% of black Americans and 27% of white Americans had bad credit, as defined by Freddie Mac in the study. But that being said, the left will sometimes claim that racial differences in loan acceptance rates remain even after taking differences in credit um, into account. And that is true. But it's also true that credit scores aren't equally accurate for black and white Americans. There was a report submitted to Congress by the Federal Reserve on how well loan performance is predicted by credit scores, and it said that across all three credit scores in all five performance measures, black Americans show consistently higher incidences of bad performance than would be predicted by their credit scores. So in other words, if you loan money to a white man and a black man with equal credit scores for whatever reason, the white man is far more likely to give you your money back. And because of things like this, the typical attempts to control racial differences in loan risk aren't sufficient for what we're trying to find, which is clear evidence of racial bias against minorities, specifically black Americans, and more specifically, not ever Asians, right? But we do actually have some evidence to suggest that racial bias doesn't exist. For example, a study done in 2019 that analyzed a data set consisting of all FHA insured mortgages that originated in 2014 and 2015, and it found that after controlling for lender effects, credit scores, and income, the interest rate gap between black people and white people was only 0.03%, and the gap between white people and Hispanic people was about half of that. So not exactly a significant gap. I mean, we're talking about three hundredths of a percent. And the study also included data on discount points, which actually revealed a racial difference in favor of non-white people. And upon combining this data into a single model, they found no racial bias in the expected pay schedule of the person borrowing. And in addition to that, they found that the expected revenue to be generated by a loan did not significantly differ by the race of the borrower. And this is pretty hard to explain within the context of the left's narrative, because we know that once other differences are controlled for, different races of borrowers experience the same expected pay schedules, which is what you would expect if there were no racial bias. And the fact that the expected revenue from the loans didn't differ between the races of borrowers means that the lenders were very likely just accurately predicting the terms which would maximize the profit from the loan in each case. And it's hard to see how this could be driven by racism instead of just economic rationality. And on top of all of that, we have studies done on several thousand banks which have found that black Black-owned banks actually discriminate far more harshly against black people than did the white-owned banks, so it would seem that racism can't really explain these things. And if it can, why are black people more racist against black people than white people are? But another thing that we hear about often is redlining. And so for those unfamiliar, the idea is that in the early 20th century, the government created maps that classified certain neighborhoods as high risk as it pertains to investment. And one of the variables that they used when estimating an area's degree of risk was that area's racial composition, which resulted in lenders being less likely to loan to people living in these areas. 
And so the idea is that black people are at a disadvantage for getting loans because of where they live. And so one thing that I want to point out is that because of that factor being weighed, a white person living in a heavily black neighborhood is going to be impacted by the race of his neighbors just as much as a black person. So the discrimination isn't actually direct discrimination because it applies equally to everybody who lives in the neighborhood, regardless of race, if that makes sense. And that's not to justify the practice, but I just, I think it's worth noting. So anyways, um, that's the idea. And so what we find is that upon controlling for the economically relevant co-founders, the probability of people getting a loan has no relation with the racial composition of their neighborhoods. We found this in Pittsburgh. We found this in Toledo. We found this in uh, Sacramento. We found this in Cleveland. We found this in Boston, etc. And the idea that redlining has increased racial inequality because it supposedly um, made it harder for black people to obtain loans and purchase homes seems unlikely due to the fact that the homeownership gap between black people and white people is similar today to what it was in the 1920s before redlining began, like we talked about earlier. So the idea that black neighborhoods are discriminated against racially in a way that prevents the residents from getting loans um, and the idea that this is like tied to redlining from the 1930s doesn't really seem to explain the differences here. Um, and like we said, once you control for the relevant factors, the differences basically disappear. But anyways, moving on to employment, this is something that's often used to explain things like wealth, this idea that black people are discriminated against in the American work environment. Let's just set aside for now the laws put in place to prevent that so we can talk about the infamous study that is often cited by the left. I'm sure that you've heard of it before. It's the study from 2017 that meta-analyzed research on hiring discrimination, and it found that black applicants received 36% fewer callbacks than white applicants, even with their applications being identical in every way other than the race implied by the applicant's name. And this type of evidence is like the quintessential evidence of obvious racism in America, not only in employment, but just in the entire country. And it's said to showcase how black Americans are held back in the economy. Um, and yeah, you know, on the surface, seems like that could be the case. But then we dig a bit deeper. Turns out not actually the case. Basically, the problem with the study is that the discrimination wasn't about perceived race. It was about perceived class. It wasn't that the names sounded black, uh, but rather that they sounded like the names of lower class people. And we can confirm that this is the case because there was a study done using data from the census to find the most common black names and the most common white names, and they did the same experiment, and they found zero evidence for discrimination against race. So again, it's not about race, it's about class. Jamal, which is the name used in the study, uh, is going to receive less callbacks than John, but so are Travis and Cletus. And ignoring that, to return to what we were talking about earlier, assuming the discrimination is true, if you gave me a choice between a completely neutral system or one where I can only apply to two-thirds the jobs as everyone else, but I'm over 20 times more likely to get into an elite school with the same qualifications as everyone else, honestly, I'd probably take the latter option. But the difference is that the former scenario, being discrimination, has been disproven, whereas the latter scenario still occurs. So to just label this as white privilege is incorrect. But besides that, since the 1960s, all employees of the federal government and most employees of the state local governments, including those working under contract, have been required to engage in affirmative action programs to increase the prevalence of minorities in their workforces. And as of 2017, there are like 14 million government workers, which account for about 9% of all the workers in the economy. So that's something to consider. And affirmative action isn't just mandated in the public sector. Like, it's also done voluntarily by businesses, just as is the case uh, with the universities. It's like woke capitalism. There was a report done in 2017 on all the companies in the S&P 100, and it found that over 90% of them had engaged in diversity initiatives, and 75% of them had gone as far as setting uh, hiring targets for minority employment. And it also found that these types of practices are rapidly gaining in popularity. Also, that study we mentioned earlier suggested that the callback racism against black people has increased since the 1970s, but that doesn't make any sense, given that America is obviously less racist and has a more diverse workforce since then. So Given that that's the case, why would the gap widen? How is this country and its system simultaneously increased and decreased in their racism? Perhaps it actually has nothing to do with racism. But anyways, from there, we can get into income, which is actually pretty quick. The left will claim that there's a wage gap between white people and black people, just like between men and women, uh, and Asian people and white people. But... When you control for education, uh, cognitive skill, marital status, and the region in which someone lives, black people actually make more money than white people. And to this, the left might hop around uh, to racism in the education system leading to this, but we've already gone over that. So that pretty much answers that. So from there, we can get into our last one, which is crime or the justice system in general. So firstly, I'm going to unapologetically link you to another video that I did a little while ago in which I go through all the most common arguments about racist police and the racist criminal justice system. It's going to be of great use to you. And that way I don't have to sit here and repeat myself since we've already been going for a thick minute now. But um, there are a few things that I'd like to add right now. So 
Typically, what we see from the left with this type of stuff is research that compares the legal outcomes for criminals after controlling for observable, that's important, observable um, differences between criminals like uh, types of crime committed, criminal history, stuff like that. And so from there, you can separate these studies into um, those that measure pretrial outcomes with those that measure post-trial outcomes. So with pretrial outcomes, there was a meta-analysis done in 2016 that looked at 36 studies on the effect that race has on the probability that a defendant would be fully charged. And this is important because 80% of cases at the state level and 90% of cases at the federal level never even go to trial. And it found that black defendants are 9% more likely than white defendants to be charged. But then in the moderator analysis, it found um, that there are a few other things worth noting, such as that this effect is only found in the South, which is interesting because it kind of, you know, we think of that stereotype where all the racist people live in the South, but there's also a lot of black people in the South. So that's interesting. But it was also interesting because there was no bias found in studies that reported their standard error. And in statistics, the standard error is the number that tells us how accurate a sample is to the population, which it's meant to represent. So that's pretty important. And so when the authors of this study didn't have one to work with, they just estimated it. And then they wrote that it was this estimation of the missing standard error um, that overestimated or underestimated the effect of race and ethnicity on the outcomes of prosecution. So the bias reported is driven by the 11 studies that failed to report their standard error. And the best explanation for the fact that there was no bias found in the 25 studies that did report their standard error is that the finding of bias when all the studies are combined is a statistical error, which means that it either doesn't exist or it exists in such a small capacity that it's basically irrelevant. And on top of that, this difference hasn't changed over time, which is the opposite of what we would expect if it were being caused by racial bias, since the country has become less racist and we have more non-white people occupying these institutions. So from there, we can look at the post-trial data. But the problem with these studies is that we find that the ones that display larger effects are more likely to be published, which demonstrates bias on the part of the authors. And oftentimes they have unreliable confidence intervals spanning from like as low as 7%, which literally means that they are potentially as little as 7% confidence in their results. So what we would need from these types of studies studies is something that controlled for publication bias and something that only included studies that included controls for obvious differences in crime types and criminal history. But since the studies that have done things like this have reduced the significance of the findings, we can't really say yet what this research is actually finding, let alone uh, that it's finding evidence of racial bias, since it actually suggests the opposite when done properly. And on top of that, uh, research on trial outcomes is inherently flawed because of what we talked about earlier, because of observational data, which means that there are so many variables that could affect these things that it would be almost impossible to measure it like in a study. There are things that could actually explain these outcomes instead of just assuming that it's because of race. Things like uh, the way in which the crimes were committed that are still classified as the same type of crime, the motivations behind these things, even the way that people present themselves in court, how remorseful they appear to be, how respectful or disrespectful they are. I mean, these are very important factors that in these cases, and they just can't really be controlled for in these types of studies. Now, a way that we can get around that would be by gathering experimental data. Things like experiments with mock juries, for example, where basically people are assigned to two groups and uh, in one group the defendant is a black person and the other group the defendant is a white person and that is literally the only difference between them. The cases are otherwise identical, which means that everything is controlled for and they have to vote guilty or not guilty. And so there was a meta-analysis done in 2005 on 34 of these which found that whites have nearly no bias in such decisions, but black people actually have an in-group bias that is 15 times larger than the in-group bias displayed by white people. So that means that black people were 15 times more likely to say that the black person was innocent than the white people were to say that the white person was innocent. And then when it came to deciding the lengths of the sentences, uh, if they were guilty, white people had nearly no bias at all, whereas black people had a bias that was 7.6 times greater than the white people. And that doesn't mean the bias displayed by black people in both cases is a huge deal, but we're comparing things along the lines of race. And so it is worth noting that relative to white people, black people had these biases in a much greater capacity. And then there was a meta-analysis done uh, in 2014 that found that white jurors had no bias against black defendants, but again, black jurors displayed a pro-black or anti-white bias. So on the one hand, these experiments are good, because if there is bias found in observational studies, we can reasonably ascertain that it's because those studies can't control for all the relevant variables, whereas experimental research can. Another thing that's important is the bias that might be held by lawyers and judges that could have an effect on these things. Sometimes the left will claim that black-sounding names uh, receive fewer callbacks from lawyers than do white-sounding names, which could have an effect. But the problem is that this has been found to be equal between white and black lawyers, so that would suggest that it's not racially motivated. Um, and as far as judges go, there was a study done which analyzed data on 40,000 sentences that were given between 1991 and 1994, and it found that being black had no impact on a person's sentence uh, between white and black judges. So in other words, black people were treated um, the same by white and black judges. Uh, and then there was another one that looked at data from 35,000 trials, which took place between 1968 and 1974, and it found the same thing. Black and white judges treated black defendants the same with respect to whether they were guilty or innocent, um, and also to the lengths of their sentences. And so
the fact that this bias is found equally between black and white judges and lawyers uh, suggests that it's not actually bias and it's actually due to other things that can't be accounted for in the standard research. So we could conclude, you know, it's that black and white people are equally racist against black people, but there's no evidence to suggest that. And given that black people in general tend to have a much stronger in-group bias than whites do um, and no demonstrable anti-black bias, this seems to be a baseless speculation. So it would seem that our justice system, just like everything else we've covered, you know, differences do exist, but they're not racially motivated. They're not because of racism or a racist system or a racial bias. I mean, these are all sophomoric, knee-jerk, virtue-signaling diagnoses of the problem. And again, the reason that we point this out isn't because we don't care about the problems or even because we want to, like, indict black people or criticize black people. It's really because we want to, firstly, exonerate white people in America for the blame, since that's just not true, and it's the popular narrative right now, and it's destructive, and it's poisonous, and it's false, and it's evil but also because ideally we want to be united as a country. And so to do that requires solving the problems that we face as Americans. But like I said earlier, incorrectly diagnosing problems brings us no closer to solving them and it wastes a lot of time and resources in the process. And in this particular case, it would seem that their overriding ambition is really just to destroy the country. And I can't allow that to happen. We can't allow that to happen and it wouldn't even solve the problem. So yeah, we can move on now. I've ended racism once and for all. Here's a video of me doing it. Stop, stop being racist. Now, that's enough. No more racism. That's not cool. That's not funny or edgy. Cut it out. Stop being racist. Stop being racist. Hey guys, if you like this video, leave it a thumbs up, leave it a comment, subscribe to the channel, uh, turn on notifications, and share the video with a friend, please. That's my favorite thing. When I see you guys sharing these on Twitter, on social media, it is my absolute favorite thing. Oh man, that was a lot of information. I actually have a, a little headache right now. Oh man. Ugh. <laughs> that was a big one. If you're still here, thank you. We appreciate it. It's me and you. And then the other people. Like, like it's it, like in French, you, when you say you sometimes like in a vu context, like, uh, it's more formal, but it also means like you, you all, that's how like y'all, you know, I don't know. It gets to a point where I talk so much that like, it doesn't even matter what I'm saying. It's just like, you, you talk so much and then it's like, what are we doing? Oh, we're talking. What are we saying? Who cares? You know, that's what's going on right now. So I'm just gonna, we're gonna cut it, but thank you so much for watching and may God bless America. Poof.